Birds are in the sky. What makes a warrior is how they see challenges and adversity as opportunities. Warriors grow, prepare, and prevail through their crucibles. Whether you're active duty, retired, or veteran, whether your battlefield is an entrepreneurship, business, or just climbing life's ladder, you'll gain some of what makes a warrior a warrior. Insight. Lessons of grit, adaptability, and the warrior's spirit will inspire you to smash through anything that stands in the way of your mission. Buckle your seatbelt as U.S. Marine veteran and international best-selling author Zachary Green interviews fellow warriors and share how they conquered their crucibles. Yes, sir, we're gonna smoke them. Good to see everybody. It's Zachary Green here on our latest episode of Warrior's Voice. I'm really excited to interview our fellow warrior, entrepreneur, and fellow podcast host, uh, Mr. Christopher Calendra. Cal Calendra? Am I saying that right? Calandra. No, oh, you were close. Damn it. I was, <laughs> I was close. Um, but uh, Christopher's got a neat story. Um, I had a chance to be on his podcast, so we're kind of switching things up again. But uh, Christopher, welcome. Thank you for having me. Having listened to your show, uh, which is great, I'm a little humbled. Some of the guests you've had on, especially some of the super impressive military folks, I am humbled because I'm always in awe of our men and women in the armed forces. So uh, this is going to be a great experience. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I want you to know that we get a lot of people that want to be on this show and we choose and screen for a very specific reason. And that is we want to see, and we only want to talk to warriors. Um, we think a lot as warriors is, is the, you know, knights in shining armor or the Spartans or a lot of the people we interview are active duty or, or combat uh, wounded veterans. But a warrior is somebody that engages in struggle and conflict and gets stronger as a result of it. Um, I think some of the strongest warriors we've had on the show has not been Navy SEALs or Army Rangers, but that mom that's working two jobs that's just trying to make ends meet. Um, and, and, and Chris, you've got a pretty incredible warrior story yourself, and I, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. First of all, tell us about your background, where you grew up, and, and kind of how you your journey took you to what you're doing right now. Yeah, so I was born and I consider raised in New York City. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, raised in Staten Island. Midway through high school, my family moved to Connecticut as part of my father's corporate relocation. And so I graduated high school in Connecticut and I went to, um, you know, Western Connecticut State University, not uh, a long way from Ivy League, but I worked a lot through school and uh, graduated and entered into the financial planning investment management field, which is a tough field to get into, Zach, at any time, but especially when you're young, you're dumb, you have no experience. I remember vividly like trying to figure out how I can tie a tie so that I could actually go to work. I realize people don't wear ties that much anymore, but, uh, tough industry in your training class, you know, young graduates that wanted to embark on the career. I mean, the dropout rate was 80, 90% because it is a field where you don't collect a salary usually. And that's true today. It's mostly generating um, income from landing clients, begin managing money. So when you're starting out, you don't have much of an advantage uh, and so it takes some time to build it up. And fortunately, the first warrior example would be toughing out those early years where I worked incredibly hard, long hours, really learned my craft, learned how to be a business person, gain experience with not only meeting and speaking with folks, but also uh, the craft of investment management, financial planning. But those years were very lean, not a lot of monetary reward. On the other side of that, though, uh, are some really, really great advantages to the business. And I've been blessed to participate in those. But in the early going, incredibly tough. Well, let's back up and talk about that. First of yeah. all, 
you graduate from college, you've got literally the whole world at your fingertips. You can go in almost any direction from backpacking through Europe to being a ski bum to working for <laughs> the big, uh, you know, uh, companies down there on Wall Street to you name it. What, what prompted you and what was it that drew you to this business? Because I know I was in your shape, too. I started out in, in financial planning and it was straight commission where most, most of my buddies were out there with very steady job, steady paycheck. What was it that attracted you to this business to begin with? Yeah, so I'm fortunate, I think, uh, in that in high school, if I was asked what I wanted to do, I always thought it would be something Wall Street investment money oriented. So it was very easy when I was a young man to seem motivated, because I was Zach, but also because I had a sense of what I wanted to do. I always find it a little interesting when some people will talk about young individuals and say, well, they don't seem motivated. And then you ask them, well, what do they wanna do? Well, they don't really know what they wanna do. Well, it's kind of hard to be motivated if you don't know what you wanna do. And so I always had a sense, even in high school, that I wanted to go into this field in some form or fashion. And I did an internship in college with, um, with a firm and I uh, had a good mentor. His name is Chris also. And I don't know where it came from, Zach, but I always had, even in college, this strong desire to enter into this field and an awareness that it would be difficult, but I was prepared to do it because I thought it would provide me the ultimate life monetarily and otherwise that I wanted to get. So I sort of had this vision and I think it was a compilation of a number of different things that I read and saw and experienced in my young years, but I definitely had a strong hunger. And uh, I'll also add, and this is with my parents, one of those um, hallmark kind of moments because my mom and I, had a knockdown, drag out fight when I told them that I was going to accept a job um, with uh, an investment firm and that I was going to go into their training program. And I was, of course, was excited, youthful excitement. And she could not appreciate that I wasn't going to get paid. And she was dead set against it. And we had, including my dad, a knockdown, drag out argument over it including me crying, running out of the house. Now I'm 21, so I'm not exactly a kid in the truest sense, but certainly young. And, um, you know, and that was a, that was kind of a rough experience, but I think that also once my mom said, okay, if this is what you want to do, we'll stand behind you hundred percent, which they did after that argument, they set everything aside. They were always fully supportive, but I think that too caused me to firmly commit because I had just had a big battle with my parents over my direction. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, you just hit and, and you, you said it so eloquently what the warrior path is. It's somebody that goes out and wants to have something that's tougher than the other person because they know that the tougher the path, usually the better the rewards are, the more you can train and learn. But then you have a crucible and a crucible is that point in your life, that crisis where whatever you've done up to that point is not enough. And in order to get through that, you have to look at the abyss and the abyss is that, that, that darkness, that failure, that destruction. And to get through that, you got to A, recognize the abyss is there, but B, you've got to transform and conquer what got you to that point. What I hear you saying is you you chose a field that you knew was difficult. Now, obviously, the rewards are very significant, but as you said, most people don't even make it through the first year or two to even uh, recoup those rewards. But then you had your crucible, and that was with your parents, and that's what caused the emotions to come flowing out and everything. And they were so scared for you of that abyss, and that abyss is not making any money and end up, you know, spending your parents spend all this hard earned money on getting you to a nice education. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my gosh, you want a job where you don't even get paid. That was enough for you to recognize and honor that the abyss is there, which is not getting paid and, and potentially losing your job and to conquer what got you there and to transform. And you did that because you said, you know what, 
I went through that difficulty. We had that big argument with my family. And at that point in time, you said, you know what, you're going to become unbreakable. You're going to make it. What was it that you noticed that was different about you than those other 80 to 90% of people that started at the same time you started and they didn't make it. And you're obviously doing incredibly well now. I, I think it's something that you talk about on your show, just the mental toughness and resiliency that I was going to hang on until I was successful and I was prepared to pay the price in terms of hours, lack of financial reward in the early going that I was simply going to tough it out. I wasn't going to be outworked and I am not saying I was going to be tougher than anybody, but I was going to be tough enough to get to where I wanted to go. What were some of those specific examples you remember early on that were so tough that you you didn't even know if you were going to get through it the next week or the next day? <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I met my wife during this time and, uh, you know, we'll get into this, but, you know, I've had a good amount of success and I have many blessings in my life financially and otherwise. But um, when I met my wife, I was in this rotten apartment. I know this is the cliche of the uh, hero's journey, the entrepreneur's journey. Um, but I was sleeping on a box spring. Um, it was a rough apartment. Uh, and at times I didn't have heat in the apartment. Now, I don't want to paint too bleak a picture. I always could have gone to my parents for help. I always could have. I had a safety net. I was not going to starve. I was not going to freeze. I was not going to be homeless. So I don't want to put this in too stark a perspective, but mentally, mentally, uh, it was part of the charm of paying the price. So it was living in a lousy apartment with no furniture, a very small budget, and also coming home to an apartment where I lived by myself during this time, I also think add another element to the toughness, living on your own during a period where you are embarking on a challenge, I found to be, especially in hindsight, very rewarding and very, um, added a lot of, added a lot to the fabric of my life moving forward. It was a, it was a tough time, but it was a good time at the same time in the same way, in a, in a, at the same time, it was both tough and very rewarding. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And just a note to our listeners. I mean, this is a warrior. This is what we talk about going the tougher route, not giving up, not taking the pleasurable route of going home and knowing that things could get a lot nicer, but knowing that, Hey, you wanted to earn your stripes. You wanted to put your uh, your time in during those early days. And, and I'm, I'm sure that made you a lot hungrier by being in that environment, knowing that, Hey, you're going to be the master of your own destiny. And you're eventually yeah. going to get yourself into a nicer apartment, into a nicer lifestyle. Yes. And I think too, uh, this was, I graduated college in, uh, 1992. Uh, and so I don't, believe that I was really established in the business with any modicum of success using money as the benchmark until 1998. So it was six years. Then that's not to say I was living as lean in the mid nineties as I was in 92, 93, 94, when it was really difficult, but I was still on the periphery of even having a permanent place in the business up until 1998. And so that's, that's a pretty good slog six years. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting you mentioned money because I, I don't think you should chase money. However, I think money is a tremendous indicator of success and how well you've done. And if you're making a lot of money, that means you're probably doing something right. If you're not making a lot of money, that means something's probably not right. And there's few industries more than a straight commission financial planning where you see that. Um, the one thing that motivated me more than money when I was in that career was um, was the ranking and seeing how good you are compared to everybody else. For me, it, it wasn't that I wanted to be number one. I expected to be number one. And when I found out there were a couple other young rookie agents that were above me, it, it really tore me up. How did, how did competition play into all of this? 
Uh, I would I would offer kind of a different perspective, and it was uh, it was a little more like the show Survivor. I think is that when somebody, especially in the early going that I had trained with and gone through this training with the the Wall Street firm, is that when if it was, I don't remember the numbers, but you figure if nine out of 10 are going to drop out, when somebody else dropped out, then my odds just got better, that I outlasted that person out, you know. Um, So I I didn't have a desire to win in the sense that I wanted to be number one. I think it was more, as I described earlier in our discussion about hanging in there and staying in the game and persevering. And so that competition was more that that person couldn't take it. That person moved on to what they think is greener pastures. That was the motivation. Perseverance. I love it. So let's talk about this now. We got to that six to eight year time frame. Things are starting to come together. Talk to me a little bit more of what that that experience was like at that point in time. Now that yeah. you've so over that your stripes. Years. Yeah. So over that six years, as I mentioned, worked incredibly hard and really improved my craft. The weakness that I had, which is common for small business owners in any field, is I didn't really have anybody to talk to. I came from a nondescript college. I wasn't. I didn't have deep roots. Uh, deep roots in the state of Connecticut. My family were not movers and shakers. So I think I had become a pretty good practitioner, but I didn't really have a good supply of potential new clients and or clients. So in 1998, I entered into sort of a joint venture with a pension administration firm that had uh, lots of clients through their like 401ks, profit sharing plans and the like. And I was brought in to help uh, cross market to those clients, individual individualized products and services. And so that really is what I think got me into well-established in the industry because there I solved my supply problem. I had lots of opportunities to talk to people and had potential clients and a little bit of a brand behind me. And then I was able to flex my muscles of all the things that I had learned during the six years, but now I had more people to talk to. That's great. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and I, you had to earn that. Um, that wasn't something they just would have given it to you, you know, a True. year or two into this thing here. True. You notice, I think one of the things that we see a lot, especially in the military and recruiting and other areas, is that as the weeks and months go by, the mission becomes more difficult, but yet it feels easier because you've got more experience. Um, would you say that was the case when you're, you know, as you know, your second yes. and third year versus your, your first year? Absolutely. Work out harder, but it felt easier. No, it does feel easier. And I think in some ways it is in a lot of businesses, particular in mine, Zach, because, you know, you planted seeds. I may have spoken to somebody in, let's say, 1994, and they may have said, Chris, you know, I'm not interested. But then by 1998, maybe they something happened in their lives or maybe they view me differently or whatever. So you plant these seeds with people over the years. And then sometimes you don't harvest those seeds until much, much later. So longevity in the business world creates its own success because you come in contact with people. And if you create a good reputation, you act with integrity, you try very hard to help people, to serve them, to put their needs before yours. If you do that consistently over time, some things happen later on where it seems easy. I had an experience, Zach, where someone reached out to me not too long ago and uh, became a client of my firm. But this is something that goes back 12, 15 years. Wow. You and now it seems that. easy. You know, they just called up and said, Chris, I need your help. I'm ready to hire you. Yeah, that seems easy. But 15 years ago was a long time ago. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, one last couple of questions here. If you could go back and talk to your younger self, what would you say to yourself? Yeah. I think it would be, I was a little rough with people. 
Um, and I alienated people along the way. I am intense. I am intense, especially younger. I probably was prone to anger quicker and in situations that it didn't really call for it. And I've gotten better at that over time. You know, uh, you do get a little wiser with age sometimes, but I would tell my younger self to uh, deal with others more gently, much more often. And that would serve you better and not just be better for people I came into contact with, but be better for myself because it's a, it's an uglier part of my personality. And um, I'm glad it's not nearly as big a part of my personality, the personality now than it was then. Did I describe that? Okay. Absolutely. And I think that's such a great thing for you to explain. I think people that are attracted to the business that you're in people that are attracted, I call it to the combat sports, which is, yes. you know, you know, cold calling is a combat sport, you know, networking is a combat sport. Uh, dealing with these type of things is difficult. We tend to get a little too intense sometimes and we lose track of the win-win and we want to just destroy or lose. Um, yes. And we look at things very binary and the reality is there is a lot of gray area in between there. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up because a lot of the, the features that make someone successful in these type of industries are also ones that can really hurt you um, in, in your long-term relationships. Um, one last question, what, you've got a very high stress business. Now, obviously you're doing a lot better now than you were 20, 30 years ago. How do you relax? How do you get centered? What are some of your skills that you can share with our other warriors out there to, to kind of have a level of mindfulness and serenity? Yeah, and, and you bring up a good point because with that success does come more responsibility. People that work for you, um, you have more clients. There's um, more uh, responsibility that you have for those clients in terms of not just money you manage, but even the importance of the financial planning you've done for them. So they're counting on you. So there's a lot of pressure. And so the mindfulness is, uh, I know it's a cliche. I used that term earlier in our discussion, but when you're working, work, and when you're playing, spending time with family, separate those two out. And I think that's um, a very important attribute for an entrepreneur, especially. And so I think that's key. Uh, try and have a um, healthy lifestyle. Uh, I am not saying I am Mr. Universe or anything like that, but try and eat healthy, exercise, enjoy the outdoors, uh, whatever gives you peacefulness and serenity, pursue those, take time for that. It's very important. And I think that the last thing is uh, to spend time thinking, and this might sound dopey, but there's working, and this is, uh, again, another cliche, but working uh, in the business as opposed to on the business. So to take time to really think, maybe with just a yellow pad of paper, think things through, a business problem, the future of your industry, uh, the future of your work-life balance, how you could solve problems, how you could pursue opportunities. Spend time to really think conceptually, big picture stuff about your business and your life in general. Take time to think that through, brainstorm, write it down, consume podcasts, books, television shows that expand your mind. I find that that also helps reduce the pressure and give me a little bit more of a a worldly, larger perspective on things. Great advice. And I'm going to listen to, I need to listen to some of that myself. <laughs> um, we're in a really interesting financial market right now. I think the last couple of months, and, and I guess you could go back the last couple of years with COVID is just turned everything upside down. What general financial investment advice would you give our listeners right now, seeing a potential upcoming bear market, seeing the volatility and all the stuff that's going on right now? Yeah, I think I would start with saying that you want to have intentionality. You want to be purposeful with your money. Nobody has success Rarely do you have success with money accidentally. I guess if you win the lotto, that would fall into the category. Um, but in these tough times, 
if you have a plan, if you've had some intentionality with what you're doing with money, uh, that takes a little of the edge off some of the pressure and the intensity of what's going on short term. And I think using that word perspective again, and it's part of the reason why I'm a history buff, is what's happening in the markets, what's happening in the economy. You know, as of this recording, the uh, U.S. stock market's in a bear market defined as a 20% drop or more. We have inflation, the likes we haven't seen for 40 years or more. We have a land war in Europe, which is crazy in and of itself. But the markets had tough periods before. I've been in the business 30 years. I went through post 9-11. There were three years in a row. The market went down. It was tough, tough times for the country and the markets and the economy. Uh, went through the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. Uh, the market went down 45% and the financial system almost ground to a complete halt. And you look back over longer in time, there's been other episodes. Not all of them are exactly the same. The current storyline often is different. There's a lot of rhyming though. And so I would tell people is it's going to be okay. The U.S. economy, this country is a great country. It's very dynamic. Uh, we adapt we evolve, we do solve problems. Sometimes it takes a little bit to do it. Um, but being optimistic in this country, about this country, has for a very long time been proven to be the thing to do. So I know it's a scary time and the country is dealing with a lot of significant issues, but I'm long-term optimistic and we've been through stuff like this before and these downturns, these difficult periods, have always in the past been followed by periods of resurgence. So that's what I'm holding out for. Chris, for our listeners that are listening and not reading, would you mind looking over your left shoulder and reading what you've got written up on your wall there? <laughs> um, so this is my uh, mantra uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's everything's going to be all right. And it's a popular country music song that's been my jam lately. I've been dealing with some personal stuff and um, uh, a loss of a loved one. And um, that song has been my jam. And this is uh, my uh, go-to mantra these days. Everything's gonna be all right. I love it. Well, I think that's a great way to, to wrap up here. Um, Christopher, if people wanted to get in touch with you, if they wanted to talk to you, anything from just following up to, to learning about your services, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Yeah, the firm that I founded is Elliott Wealth Management Services. We have offices in uh, Connecticut and Florida, but we have clients, Zach, all over the country. And go to the website, uh, ElliottWealth.com. That's two L's and two T's. You could find out more about uh, my team, about me, the work we do for clients, helping them win with money. And you could sign up for a complimentary consultation if you wanted to speak with me about your own goals and objectives, maybe about some of the craziness going on. And then lastly, I'll say I have a podcast. You and I did a great episode on it. It's uh, Simply Financial. I'm the host, Chris Calandra. So you could check that out as well. Great, Chris. Well, it's been a real pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much for your time. And, and I hear you, man. Everything's going to be all right. I love it. Thanks, Zach. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Warrior's Voice. If you haven't, please subscribe to this show and be the first to hear new episodes. You can also visit www.warriorleader.us to learn more about how you and or your business can use the Warrior Framework to conquer personal and professional crucibles.